morning, everybody. We welcome you to church this morning. We're so glad that you're here. And uh, we welcome those who are watching online as well. We're so glad that you are here. And we believe we're just going to have a good time today in the presence of God. My wife, Elisa, sent you her greetings. She woke up a little under the weather this morning. And uh, so... Uh, Please just keep her in prayer. And there's still lots of sickness and whatnot going around, but we're going to have a good time today in God's presence. So why don't we stand? Can we just take a moment just to open our service in praise? Maybe in an act of surrender to the Lord, lift your hands to Him. Invite the Lord, invite the Holy Spirit to move freely in your life. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here in this place. to move freely here. Yes, Lord. Have your way, God. You must increase. We must yes. decrease. That's right. And so, Lord, we just pray that your presence would be felt here. We invite you to work in our lives. Be pleased by our worship, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Take a minute and greet a few people around you. The Lord bless them.
Amen. Yes, that will wake you up better than a cup of coffee. He's <laughs> old. <laughs> really old. <laughs> Alright, we'll slow things down a little. Let's worship the Lord this morning.
Hallelujah, Jesus. We don't have to go through our lives in fear. If God is for us, who can be against us? God is for you. We're going to look to the Lord in prayer at this time. We are so blessed to have the Strackings in our as a part of our congregation. Pastor Billy was a pastor for many years, and, yeah. and uh, brother, I'm going to ask that you would lead us in prayer today. A lot of people sick, and uh, we especially want to pray for Pauline this morning. I'm sure that you you've heard uh, when she was in Mexico. Uh, second from last day there, she slipped on a wet floor and fell and uh, popped uh, popped her knee out. This was, uh, she's had knee replacement on that, it popped it right out. And uh, they had to pop it back in and, and flew her home. And uh, um, she needs a touch from the board. She'll be seeing her uh, surgeon on February 2nd, we just want to pray that God would um, give them wisdom, but that God would even work a miracle. I know that there's other needs that are represented here, and we all have unsaved loved ones. Pastor Billy, would you lead us in prayer, please? Thanksgiving and praise that has come before you this morning, Lord. And Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus that you would come by the power of your Holy Spirit oh, yes. and tell the natural with us this morning, Lord, Jesus. in such a supernatural way, yes, Lord, oh, as yeah. only you can. Yeah. Lord, we thank you and praise you that you are a God who looks towards our time here, Lord. I can see, Father, the things that we go through. Mm -hmm. And you know the things that we're going through right now, Lord. Mm -hmm. Lord, there are many sick in our congregation, Lord. Lord, we think of Pauline this morning, Lord. Mm -hmm. And we pray that the hand of the Nazarene himself yes, would rest upon that knee, Lord. Yes, Lord and Lord, that she would be healed yes, in Jesus' name. Yes, yes, yes. Lord, we don't come wishy washy. We come believing. Yes. We come in faith, oh God. Yes, Lord. Yes. Lord, we lift up those and others that are sick, the pastor's wife, oh, my wife, and others yes, Lord, Lord. in this congregation that need a touch from you. We ask, oh God, that our divine visitation yes, by the Holy Spirit and the healing power of Almighty God yes. and the love of Jesus will pour through each household that is represented here this morning. Father, we thank you for this place that we can gather together. We thank you, Lord, for our pastor who leads us this morning. We thank you, Father, for him and his family. We ask, Lord, that you would bless them abundantly. We pray, Lord, that as he breaks the, the power of the bread of life, the Lord, we would receive into our hearts. The words, Lord, that you give them. Yes. Lord, hide them behind the cross, O oh God, and may we see Jesus, and may we hear Jesus, and may we sense the power of the Holy Spirit in this place in yes. such a way oh, yes. that we have it for maybe some time, Lord, individually, yes. and as a congregation. Yes. And so, Lord, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you. Because you are a great God. And we know, Lord, that you hear our prayers. Yes. Our prayers go higher than the ceiling walls. They go straight to the throne room of God. With the right hand of Jesus. Jesus sitting on the right hand of the Father. Interceding on behalf of the saints. Yes. And so, Lord, we ask that you would hear the cries of our hearts this morning. And Jesus, holy name we Amen. 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 You may be seated this morning. Thank you, Pastor Billy. 
And we're definitely uh, <coughs> continuing to remember Helen in prayer. Uh, she's such a dear lady and she struggles. And uh, she needs a touch of God on her life as well. And uh, at this time, I'd like to invite the children that are here to come and join me. And it's such a blessing to have young people in the church. <laughs> Warm, isn't it? Yeah. All right. You're cold, aren't you? <laughs> All right. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this uh, this great day and for these amazing kids. Lord, as they go downstairs, I pray that their hearts would be open and receive from you. Bless those that are ministering to them. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, you guys. Just a couple of announcements this morning before we look into the word. The last uh, Monday of this month at 7 o'clock, um, all of those that Gary has talked to about uh, being greeters, we're going to have a short meeting here. And uh, so that's uh, last Monday of this month. And I believe that date is in the bulletin as well. And then the first Monday of February, that's February 2nd, I think. Um, at 7 o'clock, we're going to have our first day camp meeting here. For anybody that would like to be involved, if you were involved last year, would like to be involved this year, I really think that this day camp can become uh, the signature ministry of our assembly as we go forward and I believe it's going to be an important uh, outreach and whatnot in our community. And it takes a lot of planning. So uh, we're going to get rolling early, earlier this year, all right? First Monday in February. Also, uh, you've, you've noticed uh, membership forms on the back. And uh, what that means is, is that uh, it is the season as we approach the annual business meeting. And uh, we will have a date uh, nailed down for that by next Sunday. But uh, one of the reasons why uh, why we have membership in church is there's a few, and uh, one of them is first of all by by law we have to have an annual general meeting, and uh, in order to have an annual general meeting we have to have members that can vote on the issues. Now that aside, Bible does not um, explicitly come out and say that you need to be a member. If you're saved, if you're born again, you're a member of the family of God. Um, but we would love for you to consider taking out membership here if you consider this your church home. I've never ever believed in twisting anybody's arm. This is a decision that you make between you and God or you and your spouse and God. And pray about it and do whatever God tells you. All right? If you're comfortable with that, if you're comfortable with that. Um, but I will say this unashamedly, if you consider this your home, why not consider becoming a member? All right, that is aside. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And we're going to continue in this series that we've called Rooted. I figured at the start of this new year to give us, to help us develop deep spiritual roots that will help us to stand firm when the winds of adversity come our way. Um, I'm not a prophet, but I will say this with a certain degree of, uh, of uh, accuracy. At some point in 2023, some adversity is gonna come your way. All right? And if you're not deeply rooted in, in the love of God, when those storms come, you're going to get blown all over the place. When you're rooted in Christ and you have roots that sink deep into him, you'll be able to withstand whatever comes at you and be an overcomer. So we've, we've looked at radical gratitude. 
what it means to live a life of radical gratitude. Last time we talked about what it means to live a life of radical faith. And today we're going to look at deepening the root of radical joy. All right. Now, on any given Sunday, one of my goals is to re, re, recharge you, attach the battery cables, rev you up for the new week. Now, you know as well as I do, life gets busy, really busy, and uh, I, I really feel that this week, instead of rev you up a little bit, I'd like to calm you down. Is that okay? My goal today is for you to get relaxed. Now, relaxing doesn't mean falling asleep during the message. Okay? <laughs> if there's any one word that's supposed to describe the Christian life, it's the word joy. Joy is to characterize our lives in following Jesus Christ. Not that long ago we celebrated Christmas. The very first message at Christmas from the angel, I bring you good news of great joy. And all through scripture, Jesus' ministry was characterized by joy. Everywhere he went, he healed people and, and spoke the word. And the New Testament says the people were filled with joy. Last night after the hockey game, I did not have too much joy in my heart. <laughs> because I knew that some, some nasty ribbing was coming from people who claimed to be my friends. And sure enough. <laughs> when he sent the disciples out, when he sent the 72 out, you go ahead and look it up for yourself. It says they returned back with joy. When Jesus was resurrected on Easter morning, it says the disciples and the women who were following him were filled with joy. The Bible says that the new church was formed in Jerusalem, that the first Christian group, it says they worshipped with great joy. Paul talks in the New Testament, he says, whenever I pray for you, I pray with great joy. In fact, the Bible says this in Luke chapter 15, that every time one person steps across the line spiritually and puts their faith in Christ and gives their lives to Jesus, there's joy in heaven. A lot of people think that following Christ is all about rules and regulations and rituals and things like that, but actually, it's about joy. The Bible says this in Romans chapter 14, verse 17, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy, in the Holy Spirit. So what's he saying here? He's saying that the deeper roots you build into Christ, the more joy that you're going to have in your life. And you look around, and most people are not enjoying life. They're enduring it. They don't go through their lives with joy. The Bible says the kingdom of God, it's not about rules and regulations. It's not about rituals. It's not about... Uh, what you eat and what you drink is about joy in the Holy Spirit. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 25, I will continue with you so that you will grow and experience the joy of your faith. Did you know that the more you grow in Christ and the deeper roots you get, the more joyful God will make you and in your heart. When I don't have joy in my life, it means at that point, I'm living a shallow relationship with Christ. And I need to sink my roots deeper. Because the deeper my relationship is with the Lord, the deeper my joy will be. So what does it mean then when I mention the words radical joy? It means to be joyful all the time. Anybody can be joyful when things are going well. But radical joy is what is talked about in Philippians 4 verse 4. Where the Apostle Paul says, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. So how is it possible to always be joyful? In spite of all the things that are happening in life, the Bible says, always be full of joy. Here's the key. In the Lord. Always be full of joy in the Lord. That phrase, in the Lord or in Christ, is Paul's favorite description of what it means to follow Jesus. It is used 167 times in the New Testament. If you ever do a study on this, every time it says in Christ, it's going to show you a benefit. 
There's a benefit for being in Christ, for putting my faith in Christ, for loving Christ, for being a part of Christ's family, for being a part of what Jesus meant me to be. It says rejoice in the Lord. It doesn't say rejoice in your circumstance. He's saying rejoice in spite of it. Rejoice in the Lord. So how do we do that? Well, we look to Romans chapter 8. And I found six reasons for us to always be joyful. Always to have radical joy, no matter how hard life gets. God says you can be joyful because of these six things. First of all, I can always be joyful because in Christ, God has completely forgiven me. God has completely forgiven me. No guilt, no shame, no remorse, no regrets. God has wiped it all out. And that's a good reason for joy. Romans chapter 8 verse 1. I love this verse. There is now no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. The word no, it means zero, zip, nada, zilch. And that's so important because the number one reason people lose their joy in life is guilt. Guilt and shame are killjoys. You cannot be happy and guilty at the same time. You cannot be joyful and living in regret at the same time. These things rob you of your joy. And God does not want you to be robbed of your joy. The Bible says that the joy of the Lord is your strength. If you lose your joy, you lose your strength. Of course, none of us are perfect. We all make mistakes. We all have legitimate reasons to feel regrets and to feel guilt and to feel shame. The result is most people live their lives in self-condemnation. That's why they're not joyful. The way God wired you because you're a human being is that when you violate your conscience, it figures out a way to get even with you. You may not like that. You may try to overthrow it, but it doesn't work. You might try to rationalize it and tell yourself in your mind that what you did was okay, but it doesn't work. When you violate your conscience, it figures out a way to get even with you. You might get sick. You might get headaches. You might develop an ulcer. You might have all kinds of relational conflicts. And you, you, know, you know what happens is we, we get to the point where we sabotage our own success. God doesn't want you doing that. So he says, come to me and receive my forgiveness through my son, Jesus Christ. And then it says there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Does God ever want you to feel guilty? I think yes for about a half a second long enough for me to get to him and then say God I'm sorry and then he forgives me and then I'm not to feel guilty anymore just because I'm forgiven doesn't mean I'm not going to sin anymore it doesn't mean I'm going to be sinless but it does mean I will sin less it doesn't mean that I'm not going to make stupid mistakes we're Listen, we're all going to make mistakes the rest of our lives. <laughs> it says no more condemnation. Last night when we were watching the hockey game, there, there was a fellow here that was cheering for Montreal. It's a stupid mistake, but there is no condemnation. No condemnation. <laughs> I'll tell you, that is really good news. Really good news. When, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he didn't just die for the sins you already committed. He also died for the ones that you haven't committed yet. Mm -hmm. They're all covered in the cross. And what happens is, is that Jesus took the condemnation on himself. That's what he died for on the cross, for your sins. And if you accept what Christ has paid for you, then you're forgiven and there's no judgment on you. you reject, then you'll pay for your sins yourself someday in judgment before God. But there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. We need to learn to live in that reality. 
talking about is something called salvation. It, salvation means all my sins have been forgiven when I'm in Christ, when I've trusted him, and I can live guilt-free. The amazing thing is that even if there were no such thing as heaven, heaven or hell, and of course there is, but even if there weren't, it would be worth giving my life to Jesus Christ just so I could go through life with a clear conscience and be guilt-free. It's the first source of joy. You're never going to have real joy until you experience salvation. Psalm 13 and verse 5 says, My heart finds joy in your salvation. It is the joy of being forgiven, the joy of freedom, the joy of a clear conscience. So if you struggle with guilt in your life, you need to, this week, constantly remind yourself, no condemnation. Say it 50 times a day if you need to. No condemnation. You know what that does? It makes me want to love God more. I feel like I'm living in condemnation. I don't want to love the judge who's condemning me. But if I realize that I'm under no condemnation, it makes me want to love God more. God is very, very gracious. Secondly, I can be joyful in life always because God has given me eternal life. He's given me eternal life. What that means is that death is not the end. This is not all there is. One day you're going to die, your heart's going to stop, but that's not going to be the end of you. Let's just admit it. If this life is all there was, that would be a reason to not be joyful because there are a lot of things in life that are pretty sad. Bad things happen. Good gets crushed. Bad gets exalted. And the world is unfair. God never said it would be fair, by the way. Because of sin, we live on a broken planet, and everything's broken. This is not heaven where things are done all God's way. This is earth, and so many people reject God's way and do their own thing. Life isn't fair. It's not fair when people are, are born with disabilities. It's not fair when, when, uh, when people get raped, when people get murdered, when people get robbed. It, it's, it's not fair when somebody is killed because of a drunk or, or a high driver. If this life were all there is, it would be pretty tragic, wouldn't it? The Bible says the reason we have joy is we know we're not going to be here forever. Remember that old song, this world ain't my home, I'm just a passing through. We live a certain amount of time on earth, but that's all. And then you're going into eternity, and it's forever. If you found faith in Christ, you're in Christ. The Bible says you're going to spend eternity with God. Romans 8 verse 11. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. So just as he raised Christ from the dead, he will give life to your mortal body by the same Spirit. Well, what's your mortal body? Have you ever looked at yourself in the mirror? <laughs> That's your mortal body. And uh, speaking of myself, but of course this is the truth, everything is decaying and declining. Baldness, bulges, bifocals, among a whole pile of other things. I, I did not get the greatest sleep last night and I took a look in the mirror this morning and discovered that... Uh, I have enough rings around my eyes, I could probably open up my own jewelry shop. One of my favorite things in the Bible is, is that it tells us in heaven, I'm going to get a brand new body. No more aging, no more aches, no more pains. Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, what's heaven going to be like? We're going to be reunited with people that you love who knew the Lord. There's going to be rewards in heaven. There's going to be rest. And there's also going to be responsibilities that you love to do. We're not all going to uh, sit on clouds and play harps and, in, and eat Philadelphia cream cheese for all of eternity. We're going to have things to do in heaven and, and we're going to enjoy them. The truth is, the reason we were made, God wanted a family. He wanted that family to not just be living here on earth, but to live with him forever. His forever family. 
The Bible says in advance, God already knew who would choose to accept him, and he still chose to make all of us. He gives us that choice. Romans 8, 29. For God knew his people in advance, so that is, those who would be a part of his family, but his little choice. He chose them to be like uh, his son, so that his son would be the firstborn with many brothers and sisters. So God is our father. Jesus is our older brother, and we are brothers and sisters in the family of God. Now these first two points, by the way, they are reason enough to bring us joy for the rest of our lives. But there's a third reason we can be joyful in life, no matter what happens, because number three, God is working all things for my good. The Bible tells us God doesn't make mistakes. We make mistakes all the time, but God doesn't. God says, I can even fit your mistakes into my plan. God says that my purpose for your life is bigger than your problems. Even when you make dumb decisions and when other people make dumb decisions, he said, I can fit that into the plan too and I can turn it around and work it for your good. I'll tell you folks, that is a reason to be joyful. Romans 8, 28, we know that in all things, that's everything that happens in your life. To borrow uh, the title of an old Clint Eastwood movie, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. In all things, God works for the good. doesn't say all things are good. He works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now that is not a promise for everyone. All things do not work together for good for everybody. Listen, if I'm living in rebellion against God, and I'm thumbing my nose at God, and if I'm saying, God, I'm going to be my own God, and I reject Jesus, and I reject God's purposes for my life, all things then are working together for bad in my life. They're not working for good. And ultimately, it's going to lead me to eternity in the lake of fire. But God works for our good. Now listen, why does he do this? He does it because he loves us. God doesn't owe you anything. So you got to remember that when life doesn't seem fair and you say, God, where are you? I thought you were here. I thought He doesn't owe you anything. When you come to him and say, God, I want to live for your purpose. I don't always get it right, but I want to live for your purpose. I want to do the right thing. I want to follow you. I want to trust you. God said, I'm going to take everything in your life and I'll work it for your good. And that's a reason to be joyful. God knew before you were born all the mistakes you were ever going to make. But he says, I still have it in your plan. I'll fit it in because it allows me to be sovereign. It allows you to have free choice at the same time. God will use it for good. What does that mean? It means that I can relax. I can stop being anxious. It reduces stress in my life. God works it all for our good. It's a reason to be joyful. How can I be joyful in tough times like these last couple of years? Well, let me submit a couple of thoughts. First, you look past the problem and you look towards God and his solution. This, by the way, is how Jesus was able to endure the cross. How did Jesus put up with the pain and the agony and the suffering and the cruel death of the cross? He looked beyond it. Hebrews 12, 2, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. That means we focus on him. We focus on God, not the problem. We fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. He's using everything in your life to perfect your faith who for the joy set before him endured the cross. How did he endure the cross? He looked past it to see the joy of all the people who were going to be saved through it. He looked past the pain and he saw the purpose. He looked past the pain and he saw God's plan. He looked past the pain and he saw the reward. And that's how you do it. You be like Christ. When you're going through tough times, you go, yeah, I don't like what's going on right now. It's terrible. But I know God is working all things for good in my life. And that's a reason for joy. So you look past the problem in a second. You keep on doing the right thing even when you don't feel like doing it. When you do the right thing, it brings you joy in your life. 
Bible says this in Psalm 119, verse 143, as pressure and stress bear down on me, I find joy in your commands. Joy comes from doing the right thing at the right time. So I can be joyful always because God has completely forgiven me. He's given me eternal life. He's working all things for my good. Number four, I can always be joyful because God is for me. <laughs> he's not just with me, he's for me. He's on my side. Romans 8, 31. What can we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? You've got God on your side. What more do we need? If God is for us, who can be against us? You know, psychologists have discovered that there are approximately 645 different known fears that people can have. That's a lot of fears. Fear is a universal problem. Fear grips and paralyzes so many people. And we all have fears. Yet God said, I'm on your side. I'm for you. I'm going to protect you. What are you worried about? I wonder what your greatest fear is. Is it the fear of embarrassment? The fear of death? The fear of losing your mind? Maybe the fear of failure? One of the most common fears is the fear of rejection. And Satan uses this fear in your life to rob you of your joy. I'm going to give you some insight here, and, and, and I hope that this will be a blessing to you. Satan knows all of the things that will make you joyful in your life, so he will create a fear in your life to oppose it. So for instance, Satan knows that doing the right thing will always, always, always bring joy in your life, so he makes you afraid. If I do the right thing, other people are going to think I'm weird. If I do the right thing, people won't like me. And what's he doing? He's trying to get you afraid to do the right thing so that you won't do it. Satan knows that one of the greatest sources of joy in life is when you share Jesus Christ and the love of Christ with an unbeliever. It creates enor enormous joy. But you know what? It is also the greatest fear in a Christian's life to share their faith. And people are afraid to talk to others about Jesus. Why? Satan puts that fear to keep you from the greatest joy in your life. People will think I'm nuts. People will think I'm crazy, that people are going to call me a Jesus freak or whatever. And he creates fear to keep you away from the very things that bring you the most joy. So when you become afraid, when you have those fears and they're holding you back, you remember, God is for you who can be against you. Satan knows that speaking the truth in love brings joy, and so he's going to make you afraid to speak the truth. He'll say, uh, how can you tell anybody else about the truth? Look at your life. You're not perfect. One of the titles that the Bible gives of the devil is the accuser of the brethren. He'll start accusing you. He'll also create a system where if you lovingly speak the truth, you're going to be labeled I'll tell you, they got all kinds of labels. We're racist, we're misogynist, we're whatever. Here's what the Bible says, Romans 8, 33. Who can accuse the people God has chosen? No one. Because God is the one who makes them right. It doesn't say you're perfect. It doesn't mean you don't sin, but it says who can accuse them? No one. <laughs> God makes them right. We're trophies of God's grace. <clears throat> God says, I want you to get over the fear of rejection. That's why the Bible says, in the world, you will have persecution. You can count on it. The Bible says, be aware when all men will speak evil against you. You can count on it. The truth is, if nobody ever says anything against you, it means one thing, that you're not standing for anything. Beware when people speak well of you. The Bible says all who live 
godly lives in Christ Jesus are going to experience persecution. Why? Because there are a lot of people in this world that are 100% opposed to what you believe. And just this week, uh, uh, an athlete, I can't remember his name, stood up for what he believed in. And he's got all kinds of condemnation coming against him. We need to pray for him. But listen, in the grand scheme of things, it really doesn't matter what any of them say or how they label us or how they treat us because God is for me. God is for me. I'm going to be joyful because God is for me, even if the whole world is against me. By the way, you don't need the approval of other people to be happy. All you need to do is live for an audience of one, for God. And if God likes you and he likes what you're doing, then it is always the right thing to do. This is what Jesus told us. He said, in the world you'll have tribulation. You don't have to worry about it. Why? Because he loves us. He has overcome the world. Romans 8, 37. I love this verse. This is from the message. None of this phases us because Jesus loves us. Don't ever let anybody rob you of your joy. Don't ever let anybody take it away from you. John 17, 13, Jesus said, I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they, that means all of us, the followers of Jesus, may have the full measure of joy within them. Do you know that Jesus prayed that you would have the full measure of the joy that he had inside of you? That's radical joy. Time's getting away. I've got two more quickly to share with you. Number five, I can be joyful always because God will meet my needs. God has promised this. If I'm in Christ, God has promised to meet all my needs. So what do I have to worry about? Romans 8, 32, since God did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't God who gave us Christ also give us everything else? See the logic of that verse? If God loved you enough to come to earth to die on the cross for your sins, don't you think that anything else you've got is small potatoes as a problem? When God solved your biggest problem and came to earth to die for you, don't, he, don't you think he cares about your finances? Don't you think he cares about your relationships? Don't you think he cares about your health or about your job or about your career? He does. That's a reason for joy. And God says, I will meet all your needs. Philippians 4.19, my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. It's in Christ. God has not promised to meet the needs of everybody in the world. He promised to meet the needs of those who are in Christ. And he says, my God will meet all your needs. And I need you to notice he doesn't say he will meet all your greeds. All right? God hasn't promised to give you a McLaren or even a mansion on the hilltop. <laughs> but God said, I'll meet all your needs. What you need, I'll get it to you. God wants us to ask him in prayer for the things that we need. Over 20 times in the New Testament, God says, ask. Why does God want you to ask in prayer? Why does he want you to ask? One reason, he wants you to be full of joy. That's the reason. And so you ask him. He's your loving Heavenly Father. You know, when my kids are full of joy, it makes me look good as a dad. When God's children are full of joy, it makes God look good. A sourpuss Christian is a bad advertisement for God. Some people go around, some Christians walk around like they've been baptized in a pool of vinegar. <laughs> God wants us to be filled with joy. John 16, 24, ask using my name and you will receive and you will have abundant joy. The reason for asking is joy. And then finally, number six, and I think this one's the greatest one of all, can always be joyful because God will never, ever, ever stop loving. 
No matter what happens in my life, things go right, things go wrong, plans go awry, whatever. God will never stop loving me. I can count on it. Romans 8, 38, 39. I'm convinced, I love these two verses. I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from the love of God. Death can't and life can't. The angels can't and the demons can't. Our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow, and even the powers of hell can't keep God's love away. Whether we are high above the sky or in the deepest ocean, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. That, friends, is very, very good news. When you come to Christ and you say, I'm going to put my hand in your hand, God grabs onto it. When you say, I'm going to trust you, I want to love you, I want to be the person you made me to be, God said, I'm holding on, and I'm holding on for dear life. There will be times in your life when you want to let go of God's hands. God, I don't want to do what the Bible says. I, I want to do it my way. I want to look up that picture online. I want to cheat on my taxes. I want to lie to that person to get out of that sticky situation. I want to do this. And you're, there's going to be times in your life when you want to let go of God's hands. God will never let go of you. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. I want to close with, with the words of the great song that uh, Matt Redman wrote years ago. And it says, Oh no, you never let go. Through the calm and through the storm. Oh no, you never let go in every high and every low. Oh no, you never let go. We ought to be the most joyful people on planet Earth. Because it's a great reflection of the love of our Heavenly Father. If you want to have deep roots in Christ, get rooted in radical joy. Let's go. I don't know if you're here today, if you're watching online and never made a commitment to follow Jesus Christ, why not say yes to Jesus right now? Also in the book of Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10 it says, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This is not a big ritual that we have to go through. It's a simple prayer of repentance. Where you say to God, I need you. I've been doing it my way my whole life, and it's getting me nowhere. I turn my back on what, what I'm doing to follow you. So, why don't you just pray something like this right now from your heart? Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, I know that I've blown it. Without you, I have no hope. I ask you to forgive me of my sins, to make me a brand new person. Today I say that Jesus Christ is Lord. I acknowledge his death on the cross, and I believe that three days later, God raised him from the dead. Please forgive me of my sins and be my Lord. that prayer today for the first time you made a commitment to Jesus Christ I would love to connect with you you can send me an email if you're watching online at the, on the screen there or you can connect with me after the service be joyful the apostle Paul said rejoice in the Lord and I say it again rejoice in fact, that was old Sunday school song we used to sing, Pastor Doug. And uh, what a great reminder to all of us. If you would like to come up to the altar and spend some time in the presence of God, you can certainly do that.
and also have a time of fellowship on Hill 48. I want to thank you for being here, and the Lord bless you.